Uh, hello, my friends, and welcome to Reflections Upon the Precious Book Divine. My name is Rick Pope Joy, and I have the distinct privilege and the wonderful pleasure of serving as your host today as uh, we have arrived on this, uh, well, this beautiful Tuesday morning. And uh, what an opportunity we have as uh, we have uh, such uh, uh, tools as the Internet, Facebook, uh, things such as that to be able to draw us. Uh, close together, even though we might be far apart. And uh, so we're always uh, uh, thankful for the blessings that God has bestowed upon us. And we pray that men might use these tools appropriately and uh, not inappropriately. And uh, so we're so thankful, uh, my brethren, that uh, we can be together in such a manner as this. I do want you to uh, continue to pray for uh, Miss Mona as uh, uh, she struggles with her sickness and uh, uh, others who are uh, uh, sick during this particular time, uh, whether or not it is uh, the coronavirus or something else. We pray that uh, all are uh, within the uh, wonderful benevolence of God in their care. And we know that God is a good God uh, regardless of the outcome uh, that may be invested with us. Uh, the one thing that we do know is that uh, uh, God has given his son, Jesus Christ, to die upon that cruel cross so that you and I might one day spend eternity in heaven. Well, let's see here. What do we have? Uh, oh, I do want to mention uh, that this is study hall for the brave, for the spiritual-minded Bible student. Now, the reason why we mentioned that and I try to explain this, is we deal with subjects that are often controversial, subjects that are often uh, uh, seen as controversial. There's really no, no discussion that you could have uh, that would not be controversial. Uh, but we do want people to understand that this is, uh, uh, that we will make no apologies for what God said, nor the manner in which he said it. We believe God. Uh, we believe that he is omnipotent, that he is omniscient, uh, that he is omnibenevolent, and uh, all of the omnis that the Bible throws out there, we believe that God is that. So anything that he says is for our benefit, for our best interest, and uh, we simply will not be presumptuous to apologize for that. Well, let's see here. Uh, I hope that you're prepared and poised and ready to study, to meditate. Uh, that's right, to reflect upon the precious book divine. This week, we've been focusing our attention upon the concept of miracles. And we talked about yesterday, the fact that miracles do not need a biblical argument. That is, uh, now the cessation of miracles certainly would be, but miracles themselves don't need a biblical argument. They just need a demonstration. Jesus never argued that he could work miracles. He just worked miracles. And uh, so uh, when we're talking about the cessation of miracles, uh, then we must present arguments as to uh, why those miracles no longer exist. And the observable evidence is that miracles do not exist. And we'll talk about that as uh, time progresses. But just to give you a little, I guess they call that a teaser in uh uh, real radio and real television, uh, but uh, 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 so I guess I just teased you a little bit. So uh, I'll quit teasing you and uh, we'll get on to our uh, business. Well, let's see here. I want to welcome everyone. Certainly want to give you an invitation uh, to come and join us at the Nesbitt Church of Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. We meet uh, every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our Bible study, 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. for our opportunities of worship, and we meet every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Certainly uh, hope that you could come and uh, join us for our opportunities of study. I'm going to go ahead and take the opportunity right now. For those of you on radio, uh, you're not going to be able to see this, uh, but I'm fixing to put a cough drop in my mouth. 
and there we go. So uh, I don't need to explain it to you on Facebook. Now that, by the way, that's just a simple illustration about miracles don't need a uh, dem- uh, don't need a biblical argument. They just need a demonstration. You, if you're on Facebook, you know what I'm doing. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, we're certainly welcome that uh, you are here with us, and we want to encourage you to come by and see us at the Nesbitt Church of Christ. Now, if you're listening to us via WJHF 106.9 FM in the Florence, Alabama area, we want to encourage you to go by and see our family and friends at the Jackson Heights Church of Christ. You might give them a call. I don't know what their schedule is as far as uh, as far as far um, the uh, uh, the congregational meeting times at this particular time. COVID uh, has uh, changed a lot of meeting times. So uh, you might give them a call and uh, go by and see them at the Jackson Heights Church of Christ. Well, let's see here. Uh, <clears throat> what else do we have? Phone number today. Now, there are, there are multiple ways in which you can contact us. The phone number, text message. If you have a question or comment that you would like to uh, uh, express on the air, you can certainly do that. And uh, that number is 405-428-2440. Once again, that is 405 428 Four four zero. That's the number uh, each day for us. Now, uh, if you're uh, watching on Facebook Live, then you know that there's a chat window right there. If you are on TGRN, there's a chat window. Uh, radio, Facebook Live, chat window. So you can join us uh, there. You can uh, make your comments, ask any questions that you want in regards to the subject matter of the day. Let's see here. Oh, one more announcement before we uh, go to our prayer and uh, song. And I do have some introductions to make here, but uh, uh, the Standing in the Gap Lectures, uh, Nesbitt, Mississippi, January the 27th through the 31st, 2001 is just, I mean, it's just a couple months away, brethren. And so we would love uh, to have you come and join us to make that a part of your uh, yearly schedule. Uh, if you'll let me know in advance, I'll see what I can do about setting up uh, a place for you to stay. Uh, just let me know. But once again, that's January the 27th through the 31st, 2021. Can you imagine we're already saying 2021? Uh, that is amazing, isn't it? All right, let's see here. Uh, I do have uh couple of individuals I always like to recognize our Bible students that I know that have joined us. Sister Sainer from uh, South Oklahoma. Of course, Miss Mona is here. She is uh, feeling a little bit better this morning, but uh, uh, good to see her. She keeps me in line. Uh, Sister Woodall from uh, Northern Wisconsin and says that her family uh, is there as well. We uh, uh, certainly want to uh, uh, say hi to everyone that is there. Dane McGinnis uh, from uh, uh, out there. Well, North Texas, West Texas. Uh, uh, we'll just call it that. If I need to uh, uh, correct, uh, you need to correct me, Brother Dane, you go right ahead. Brother Scott Furness is here with us from central Oklahoma, my old stomping ground, or actually my old birth grounds, I guess. Uh, he's uh, in Purcell and I'm uh, I'm uh, from Winniewood, Oklahoma, so good to have uh, you with us. Uh, um, well, I hate to hear that, Sister Woodall. Uh, 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 I, I'd say I hate to hear that, but at the same time, if this is a good godly uh, Christian, then uh, uh, then we can only uh, uh, have the hope of heaven and uh, such a joyful occasion uh, at that particular time. 95 years of service and are 95 years old and uh, returns to. Uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, ta, 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 let me see here. Uh, anybody? Oh, Sister Jensen has joined us uh, uh, from uh, the state of Washington. Good to have you. And uh, Sister Higgins from Texas. I know there are others uh, that are uh, listening. Uh, Sister Woodall, I'm thinking that What you're saying is that Ernie Lowry was the uh, gospel preacher who uh, passed away, who had preached uh, for decades in 
the state of Wisconsin, and we certainly want to uh, uh, pray for him or pray for his family uh, in uh, this time of loss. But at the same time, we're grateful for the for the servants of God and the work uh, that he did. A World War II veteran, and uh, we're certainly grateful for his service uh, to our nation as well. Well, let's see here. What else do we have? I can't think of anything else on our agenda, so I just want to say uh, welcome to the program, and uh, please join me in a word of prayer. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before thee at this time, we are so pleased that you would allow us into thy presence. We know that we have sinned. We know that we have uh, fallen short of thy glory, and we know that we are uh, have been unrighteous, but only through the blood of thy son, Jesus Christ, would those sins and that wickedness be taken away so that we might be able to stand before thee in this prayer, in uh, thy presence, that we might be able to offer up our prayers and supplications and intercessions before thee. We ask that you would receive our gratitude for the fine gift of thy son, for the New Testament church, for the Bible, which tells us of that great story of redemption. We're mindful, our Heavenly Father, of those uh, uh, men and women who have uh, been great servants of thine. Uh, Brother Lowry, we uh, pray for uh, uh, his family, and if he's been faithful uh, 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 to thee, our Heavenly Father, we pray that, that you might bless him with those beautiful words, enter in uh, to thy glory. We know that uh, Abraham's bosom or uh, paradise awaits those that have been faithful, and uh, we pray such, and it is our hope that men such as that will be found uh, with Lazarus and with Abraham and with the uh, uh, saints of God throughout all generations. We anticipate and we wait the great day of judgment and the coming of our Lord into this earth, the destruction of all things and uh, the entrance in that thy saints will have into that glory land. Father, we realize that uh, uh, many individuals will not enter because of fear and unbelief. We pray, our Heavenly Father, that uh, the preaching of thy word might strengthen our resolve to uh, live as thy children faithfully in thy service. And it's in his name that we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Sadness anywhere, ain't no need to shed a tear. You're walking on heaven's road, and when you're walking on heaven's road, I gotta lay down my heavy load. Jesus said, He walked along with me. Praise God, glory, hallelujah. I'm singing all the way. I got sunshine in every day. Won't you come along? Join me on that heaven's road. Young folks walking hand in hand, singing with the angel band. Old folks ain't so tired and warm. They're walking on heaven's road. And when you're walking on heaven's road, I gotta lay down my heaven load. Jesus said he walked along with me. Praise God and glory. Hallelujah. I'm singing all the way. I got sunshine in every day. Won't you come along and join me on that heaven's road? Won't you come along and join me on heaven's road? All right, my friend, such a beautiful song, such an encouraging song. Uh, I always get uh, a great uh, a great sense of resolve to do what is right and to be godly uh, from listening to uh, such songs as this. And I pray, 
uh, that the same is true for you. Now, yesterday we began a series of studies dealing with the aspect of miracles, and we talked about how to prove miracles work and uh, or how to demonstrate uh, uh, miracles. And uh, there seems to be a lot of confusion on this world today uh, concerning the topic of mir miracles. And as I mentioned yesterday, this is not just a doctrinal issue from the vantage point of what does the Bible say, but it is a doctrinal issue from the vantage point of apologetics. And I do think that we need to see it as an apologetic. So, Cause some people will say, well, what does it really matter? I mean, some people believe in miracles and some people do not. What does it really matter? Well, here's what, why it matters. When people see how gullible Christians, uh, I say Christians in quotation marks, uh, religious people are, and, and they see them being duped by uh, trickery and sleight of hand, then what ends up happening is that these are individuals who say, well, if, if you can be uh, duped in regards to that, what say, uh, maybe, maybe Jesus was just a sleight of hand artist. Maybe the apostles just learned how to uh, uh, move the hand uh, faster than the eye could see. And so maybe that's what uh, Bible miracles are all about. Maybe they really did not occur the way that they are uh, said to have occurred. And maybe the Bible, therefore, is not true, that it's a deceptive document. And uh, so uh, if it is, if it is a false, then, uh, uh, then why, why have anything to do with it? It is, see, it's a, it's a uh, doctrinal issue from the vantage point of just a practical Bible study. Yes, we don't want anyone to believe a lie. Why would we want, you know, it, it's amazing in our society today, that people just don't care whether or not it's the truth or a lie. I'm going to believe it because that's what I want to believe it. It establishes my agenda, what I think in life. And so I'm going to believe it, whether or not I've proven it to be true, whether or not it's a lie, it doesn't really matter. Truth or a lie is only in one's concept. That's the mentality of today. And I just don't get it. That is as foreign to uh, any kind of sound reasoning as you can get. Uh, but we did talk about the fact that biblical miracles they don't need biblical proof. They just need a demonstration. If you can work, listen, if you can part the Red Sea, uh, well, there's uh, Lake Michigan up there. I, there's some pretty wide spots in the Mississippi down here. Uh, uh, you know, uh, you don't have to go too awful far uh, to be uh, from a body of water. And uh, if you can raise the dead, then uh, where are the dead being raised? Uh, that, see, uh, and so... One of the points that I want to make is, uh, and we touched on this just a little bit yesterday, is the fact that the empirical evidence is lacking uh, in uh, uh, the miraculous realm as well. Many claims of miraculous works have been thoroughly debunked. They didn't happen. It, <clears throat> excuse me, it wasn't a miracle. Many of the claims cannot be tested due to the nature of the claim. You saying that you had something inside that you and and this occurred uh, does not prove a miracle and uh, so forth and so on. Many claims have been made uh, by charlatans and they have been proven to be false. And uh, yet at the same time, people still believe them. And so the empirical evidence, even if that's all you had to go on, it's it's lacking. And so today, what I would like for us to deal with is de to deal with the nature of miracles. Now, uh, the, the point of dealing with the nature of biblical miracles is to show you the contrast between biblical miracles and so-called modern day miracles in regards to uh, two things. You can see a, a, a clear, when you read your Bible and you read about the, the miracles that occurred, uh, then, uh, and, by, and by the way, some of these things were 
uh, maybe brought about naturally. Uh, uh, listen, a flood is a natural event. A uh, 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 fire from heaven is a natural event. Uh, that's but sometimes the timing is the miracle. And I wish we had more time even to discuss uh, the nature of miracles from that vantage point in the fact that it wasn't the fact that the, uh, uh, the, the rivers of the Jordan or the uh, Red Sea dried up. That has happened before during dry, times of drought. Uh, but uh, during times of flood uh, and to have a particular uh, timing associated with it. The plagues are a good example of that. The stopping of the plagues the timing of when it began and the timing of when it stopped and why it stopped. Those are timing issues uh, in regards to uh, miracles. And so that's a part of our discussion, but I fear that we won't get that far uh, in our uh, discussion in regards to that. Now, uh, oh, I can't tell you his name. Uh, I have a good book in my library. Um, uh, on the miracles of Jesus, and uh, he discusses uh, uh, Brother Roy, uh, Brother Gaddis Roy, uh, comes to me now, uh, has uh, written, he has, uh, I think, 54 sermons on the miracles of Jesus, and it's an excellent book. I've used it in my preaching uh, many times. In fact, one year, I had an entire year just dealing with the miracles, the discourses, the prayers, uh, the sermon, or the, uh, the well, a couple other things on just the life of Jesus the entire year. I'm hoping that I can uh, redo that either uh, this next year or the year following that. How important it is for us to study about the life of Jesus. And uh, sometimes, uh, uh, we reference everything under the sun, and we, we leave uh, the uh, foundation out of all of that. And I certainly don't want to be guilty of that. But let's talk about these miracles, and let's look at some Bible verses that will help us in regard. What separates modern-day miracles from biblical miracles? That's the terminology we're going to, modern-day miracles versus biblical miracles. Number one is the fact that, <coughs> excuse me, number one is the fact that biblical miracles were instantaneous. Modern day miracles, not so instantaneous. The miracles of the Bible did not require lengthy periods of time, lengthy periods of prayer, and waiting for the results. There, there were no six months down the road, I, I felt better. No, everything happened immediately in the Bible. I like that. Sister Woodall says, well, one was fake, one is true uh, or real. That is correct. Uh, one is fake and one is uh, 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 real. But what makes it so obviously fake and real is the instantaneous nature in which it occurred. Now, there are a lot of verses like this, but look with me at Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 3. Now, this is immediately following the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and so after the words of Jesus, you have the confirmation by chapters 8, 9, and 10, or chapters 8 and 9, with a, a host of miracles confirming the word that he spoke. But in chapter eight and verse number three, notice it says, and Jesus put forth his hand and touched him saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. You see, that's the, that's the uh, 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 demarcation between modern day miracles and uh, uh, Bible miracles. Bible miracles are instantaneous. How about Acts chapter 9 and uh, verse number 40? 
Acts chapter 9 and verse number 40. And notice here, it says that when, when Peter went in, this is the, the story, you remember the historical account of Dorcas. It says here that uh, uh, when Peter went in, that uh, uh, this is, look with me at verse number 40. Peter put them forth, kneeled down, prayed, turning to the body and said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes and said, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. There was no grogginess. There was no, uh, oh, let me see here. Uh, I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling a little bit better. Thank you, Peter. And, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, energy had, you know, she spent a week in bed and then she, I mean, she just got better. No, uh, she opened up her eyes. She saw Peter. She sat up. Go back to Matthew chapter eight and notice verse number 15. Now, Mark chapter eight and uh, verse number 15. Uh, it says, and the fever left her. This is Peter's mother-in-law. Fe fever left her. She arose and ministered unto them. Now notice here that uh, the leprosy in Matthew 8, 3 was cleansed immediately. Uh, when uh, Dorcas uh, was healed and brought back to life, and you're right, what m must have been a fantastic uh, thing to witness. By the way, think about the term wonder. And they wonder. Sometimes a miracle is described as a wonder. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 3 they work signs, miracles, and wonders, and uh, gifts of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. And uh, so they had these. They had these wonders. Wonder is looking at that miracle, that power of God being exerted at that particular point from the vantage point of the people who saw it. They wondered. They were amazed. That is, it must have been fantastic to see. That's uh, exactly uh, what. Now you have Peter's mother-in-law. Uh, she just gets up and starts serving. Again, uh, the energy level at that time, the entirety of the body being completely restored, not over a period of time, not through the process of the natural healing that goes on with the body and medication and things such as that, no, she immediately was healed and she immediately arose and she immediately began to serve them. Matthew chapter 12 and verse number three. Uh, and uh, notice this. Uh, and it was restored whole, withered hand, whole like the other. So this miracle was instantaneous. It wasn't just the fact that uh, uh, you know what? I, I think I can move this hand a little bit better. Oh, it's still got a little, uh, uh, a little, uh, uh, difficulty in it, but, uh, boy, before I couldn't move it at all. And now look, I can move it like this. Uh, and, uh, no, it's, it's not that way. Biblical miracles were instantaneous. And by the way, we'll deal with this when we get down to it. Uh, but it was not, it was not, there were no short miracles. Um, and so uh, the miracles were instantaneous uh, in this effort. Number two, let me suggest to you, when we talk about the difference between modern day miracles and we talk about uh, uh, biblical miracles, biblical miracles, uh, things such as distance did not matter. Now, in modern day miracles, you got to be at the tent meeting, right? You got to be at the, uh, uh, the, the guy's got to come by and see you. And he's got to, he's going to lay hands. He's going to make some fancy remarks. He's going to make a big show out of it. Exactly what Elijah, uh, Elisha said he would not do, uh, to the army general of Syria, right? He would not make it go wash in the Jordan. Your leprosy will be cleansed. It wasn't cleansed on the first time, not the second time, not the third time, but he was told to dip seven times. You're talking about timing. There's your timing issue. The seventh, he was instantaneously healed. 
Now, but some miracles were performed from a distance. They did not require immediate contact at all. John chapter 4, verse 50 through 52, you have the nobleman's son. And uh, the nobleman's son was, according to all uh, ge geography, was about 20 miles away. And uh, uh, he was healed. In fact, notice with me, John, let's just go over to John chapter 4, and uh, let's notice here verses uh, 50. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word, and Jesus spoke unto him. He went his way. And he's going down. His servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour, that's timing, right? The hour uh, when he began uh, to amend. And they said unto him yesterday at the seventh hour. Now, notice it doesn't say he began to be healed. That's what he wanted to know. But he doesn't say that. So, no, no the fever left him. And the father knew that it was that self, that same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. And uh, so Jesus was uh, 20 miles. Listen, if you are, time and space are not obstacles for an eternal God. Jesus is God dwelling in, the, in human flesh. There's no obstacle uh, uh, I, I realize that in his body, he is limited by time and space. He could not be, uh, and that, by the way, was by choice of limitation. He did not uh, uh, give it up to where he didn't possess it anymore. He just chose not to utilize and to do that. But notice, time and space had nothing, uh, nothing uh, on Jesus. Now, uh, he could heal somebody 20 miles away. He could heal somebody 200 miles away. It wouldn't have mattered in regards to that. Look with me in Acts chapter 19. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse number 11, there's some interesting, there's an interesting event that takes place in the life of the apostle Paul. It says, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. You're talking about confirmation. Did, did God know that Paul was going to have a lot of controversy concerning uh, uh, his apostleship? You bet he did. So he gave him special miracles. And here was one of them. So that from his body were brought under the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and uh, the disease departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Paul didn't even have to be present. Uh, here's a handkerchief. Go take it to somebody, and they're and they're healed. That, by the way, is called a special miracle by the hands of Paul. Paul didn't have to be there. Jesus didn't have to be there. Uh, time and space has nothing to do uh, uh, in regards to an omnipotent, eternal God. God is the one working the miracle. You understand not the apostle Paul. It is through Paul, but the power belongs to God. And so if you're just looking at a distinction between modern day miracles and biblical miracles, biblical miracles were instantaneous and distance had no factor on them at all. Uh, uh, by the way, good uh, Gunter, uh, uh, Dane says Gunner, is his home. Okay, good Good to have that uh, information. Now, number three, uh, sometimes miracles are even against one's own will. You know, and, and the reason why I bring this one up is when you talk to uh, people who believe in miracles and a miracle didn't work, who gets the blame for that? Well, that person just didn't believe. Now, they could have all the belief in the world, and uh, it wouldn't matter. See, sometimes miracles are even against one's own will. Look with me at Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, uh, verses 6 through 11, we find that Paul struck a man blind. 
Now, do you really think that this guy wanted to be blind? <laughs> when you read this, Paul didn't come to him and say, you know what? Or this guy didn't come to Paul and say, you know what? It'd be a good idea if you distract me blind today. I think that I, I, I want to be blind for a season. No. Notice what it says here. And when they had gone through uh, Pantheus and found a certain sorcerer, false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. And Elimaeus, the sorcerer, for is his name by interpretation, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. So we know what his will was. We know that what he was wanting. But now notice here, then Saul, who is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes upon him and said, O oh, full of subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, enemy of all, uh, uh, of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And by the way, he struck him blind. Now, isn't that interesting? Paul struck a man blind against his will. So a miracle, and this is a good point for us to keep in mind, a miracle does not depend upon the belief. In fact, Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead, not just blind, but now they are struck dead uh, in their tracks. Do you think that Ananias and Sapphira wanted to die, that it was a part of their will to die that day? Why, why deceive the church of money if it has to do with uh, uh, they wanting, they're wanting to die? No, had absolutely nothing uh, to do with that. So now this, I think, is important to set up our next point. So miracles, miracles, number one. Yes, I'm going to get some hot tea and some lemon and some honey uh, after this program. And uh, I've got some uh, over at the over at the house, and that's where I'm going after this. So number one, uh, miracles are instantaneous. Uh, distance didn't have anything to do with it. Sometimes miracles were even against one's own will. Now, the recipient's faith, and this is number four, is not required. Now, that's why I wanted to set this one up by looking at the fact that sometimes it was even against their own will. But the recipient's faith is not necessary in order for uh, them to uh, receive a miracle. In fact, faith healers, as I mentioned earlier, oftentimes blame uh, people when they're unable to perform a miracle. No one. Listen to me very carefully. No one ever blamed for, uh, is ever blamed for a failure of a miracle because of the recipient's lack of faith. No one. And by the way, sometimes Jesus would not attempt a miracle because of their lack of faith. He just wouldn't do it. Now, I'm not going to do it because of your lack of but Jesus never, listen to me very carefully here. Jesus never attempted a miracle that he was not successful with. It didn't matter whether or not the person had faith. Jesus did not work a miracle because it wouldn't work because he didn't have the power uh, to do so. <coughs> do you think all those people who died in the miracle of the flood wanted to die? Do you think all, 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 of, all of the people who died in Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to die? No, what I'm telling you is the fact that faith on the recipient is not necessary to receive. Uh, in fact, in fact, uh, the lame man in Acts chapter three wasn't even expecting to be healed. Peter and John went there, you remember, and uh, they go to work that, and uh, what happens? Uh, uh, excuse me, they, they're going to the temple, and uh, the man is calling out for alms. He wants money. 
And, and Peter says, listen, I don't have any money for you. But what I do have, I'll give you. And he healed him and the man got up and walked. Now, my point is simply a, a, a simple one. He didn't expect a miracle. It had nothing to do with his faith. It had to do with the power of God. By the way, Sister Sainer says, uh, please explain Mark 8 and 24, where Jesus laid his hands on the blind man twice. And I think that's an important one for us to deal with on Friday. So I'm going to mark that for the Friday, open mic Friday. Uh, we're going to deal with some uh, uh, pertinent questions in regards to miracles. And uh, that is going to be one of them. And so... Uh, uh, we'll definitely explain that on Friday when we get there. Uh, but again, the, the point is that the recipient and their faith uh, was not required at this point. And uh, so you have, number one, miracles are instantaneous in the Bible. Not so today. Miracles uh, occur regardless of the distance. Not so today. Sometimes miracles are even against one's own will. Not so today. In fact, the, the, the recipient's faith is not required in the Bible, but it is required by faith healers today. And then uh, number five, faith was only required, listen to me very carefully here, of the miracle worker not of the recipient of the miracle. See, when a miracle failed, it was the faith of the miracle worker, not the faith of the recipient that was suspected. So notice here with me in Matthew chapter 17, verses 19 and following. Matthew 17, verses 19 and following. Then came the disciples of Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? And he said unto them, because of your unbelief. Now I want to pause there. This is a pause for effect. Okay. Uh, I, this is a pause. This is a sailor moment. This is a pause for meditation. Did, did, you, did you hear what it says? Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief. And then he goes on to explain uh, some things, but it was the problem was not with the recipient, but with the miracle worker himself. You know, I've never heard, a miracle worker say, you know what? I just don't have enough faith to work this miracle. Never heard that. And I'm going to bet you have never heard that either. Well, okay, I won't bet you, but uh, I, I'm I'm 100% positive you've never heard that. Okay, maybe I'm 99.9%, .9%, but I, I've never heard it in my entire life. And I've talked to a lot of them. But not once did they ever say. Notice that uh, Jesus stilled the sea when the disciples even lacked faith. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 26, the sea was raging. Look over there with me. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 26. We're going to back up to verse number 23. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, <clears throat> Excuse me. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Now, no, these are professional fishermen here. They've seen storms before. They understand when a storm is really, really, really bad. But even at that, the disciples came to him and awoke him and saying, Lord, save us. We perish. You can hear the fear in their voice. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful, O ye of little faith? 
Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey? They, they didn't believe. They had a lack of faith, little faith, as he says here. And yet Jesus healed anyway. So faith on the recipients is not necessary for a miracle. They see that's the difference between modern day miracles and biblical miracles. And then finally, I, I want to talk about this and uh, uh, th that uh, they were complete rather than partial. And this really distinguishes between uh, the, the types of miracles that we're talking about today, modern day miracles and uh, uh, miracles that are uh, uh, biblical miracles. Biblical healing miracles were complete miracles. Uh, that uh, the blind man didn't uh, 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 didn't get partial sight, even in the uh, uh, earlier passage uh, that we'll discuss on Friday of Mark eight and twenty four. Uh, he did not end up with partial uh, sight, but he got full sight. The man with a hand didn't just get a stronger arm; he received a new hand. Uh, over and over again, you'll find, uh, in fact, let's just, we, I think we've got a little bit of time to do some reading here. Matthew chapter 11 and verse number five. Matthew chapter 11, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk and the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear and the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Now here's what it doesn't say. The blind receive some of their sight back. The lame are uh, hobbling. Uh, the lepers are uh, almost cleansed. And uh, the deaf, uh, they can hear a little bit better. Uh, the dead are uh, semi-raised. I don't know how you can be semi-raised, but uh, no, there, it was always complete. It was never partial in any way at all. And look with me at Matthew chapter 15 and uh, verse number 30. Matthew 15 and verse number 30. Notice what the, and great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others. And he cast, and they cast down at Jesus' feet, and he partially healed every one of them. No, he healed every one of them. They were completely, uh, fully healed, not partially healed. Uh, look with me at Matthew chapter 20. Uh, let's begin in verse number, well, let's begin in verse number 29. And, and as they departed from Jericho, a great number followed him. And behold, two blind men were sitting by their side. And when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, Lord, thou son of David. Uh, and the multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cried the more, saying, Have mercy upon us. Uh, o Lord, thou son of David. And Jesus stood still and called them and said, What will you that I should do to you? And they said unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Again, we could go on and on with the biblical examples that it was not the man with the withered hand, right? Uh, it wasn't just that he, he got a little bit of strength uh, or that uh, his arm, no, his withered hand was made like unto the other. Did you catch that? Like unto the other. It was, uh, it, it was not about uh, uh, just partial. It was complete. It was restored whole, like unto the other, uh, Matthew 12 and verse number 13. And so uh, can you state it any better than that? Any plainer than that? No, you cannot. Paul teaches us in, and I want to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I always want to, in each of these lessons, remind us of, of the aspect of what we're talking about, that there were some things that were partial. Uh, there were some things that were temporary in nature. 
there were some things that were going to vanish away. And uh, uh, that when that which is part was come, that which is partial would be done away. And so uh, Matthew, or 1 Corinthians 13 and verse number 10, uh, he says, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. He's very clear in the context of what the partial was. And so that in part, miraculous activities, those are going to be uh, done away with. We have something that is greater than miracles. The miracles confirm the word, but that's kind of interesting, is it not? Even in the statement of, of Mark chapter 16 and verse number 20, Jesus working with them, confirming the word. Matthew 16, verse number 20. Uh, but think about this, confirming the word. Miracles were designed for confirmation. That which is, and I, I, want, I want us to end with this particular, that which is confirmed is greater than that which confirms it. That which is confirmed, there's a reason why uh, this was going to be confirmed. And the reason why is this is what saves men. James chapter one and verse number 21, you engraft the Bible into your life and that will save you, the Bible says. Miracles never saved anybody from their sins. So it is important that we understand the difference between biblical miracles and miracles that are being done or these false, fake miracles that are being so-called done or accomplished today. Well, my friends, I know that we just have a few minutes left. I'm going to go ahead and close our program uh, for today. As you can tell, my voice is just about to give out, uh, but I was not going to leave you holding uh, in regards to our study on miracles. Hopefully we can see that the nature of miracle, biblical miracles, and how they differ from the man-made stuff today. God bless and have a wonderful day.